So, good morning, Beacon Church. I'm Adam. I'm an elder in training here, and this is our responsive reading. We do this every week using the material of the New City Catechism, which gives us a series of questions and answers whereby we as a faith or as a church can confess the faith that unites us as a body in Christ. So as we work our way through the New City Catechism, it's quite handy because it gives us a nice systematic structure that shows us, um, basically walks us through the whole of redemptive history. But ultimately, it's something that people put together. And we don't hold the writings of men to be authoritative. Rather, we look to scripture alone as a sole authority for faith and practice. So we like to take these questions and these answers, but ultimately let them drive us to see what the scriptures have to say about them. In the last uh, month, really, we've been going through the Ten Commandments, uh, showing how they are a summary of God's moral law. Uh, and this week, we're specifically asking, what does God require in the Ninth and the Tenth Commandments? Um, these commandments we can find in Exodus chapter 20. We can also find them again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But before diving in, I'd like to take a moment to again remember that this is a rather systematic summary of things, so we've built upon things. How did we get here? Well, we're talking about the Ten Commandments as part of how we can glorify God by loving him, by trusting him, by obeying his will, commands, and law. So the Ten Commandments, while framed as a you shall not, we should always try to discern what is the you shall, what should we do as a result of these commands, not just what should we uh, refrain from doing, and what can we positively do. Uh, and as these commands point out to us how we fall short and how we transgress God's law, we should always remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we'll find ourselves resting our salvation not on works we have done, but rather in Jesus, his substitutionary atoning death and his resurrection. So with that said, then, what is the ninth commandment? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. I don't know about you, but in North America, I think it's a pretty common idea that the idea of witness would make us think about a courtroom setting. There's some sort of altercation that happened between two or more people. And they can't settle it. So the case gets brought before a judge, maybe with a jury, maybe just a judge. I'm going to say just a judge for simplicity. The judge's goal in this case, if they are an honest judge, is to discern the truth as best as is humanly possible, and then to render a judgment about this case according to the law. But the judge was not there when this altercation happened. So how do they discern what happened? How do they discern the truth? They rely on witnesses. Witnesses are called, and people give their account of what happened. Then those testimonies are scrutinized by whatever evidence there is, maybe, as well. And compared with the, so we compare it with the evidence, and ultimately that's how the judge frames what happens. Their best idea of what happens and renders their judgment. But this means there's a degree of trust that's placed in those testimonies, in the witnesses in the trial. So if a witness lies and bears false testimony, they distort that judge's view of the altercation. They distort, their words have a direct impact on the carrying out of justice. They pervert justice. In contrast to Job 34, 12, where Elihu says, the Almighty will not pervert justice. And it's no wonder then that Solomon in Proverbs 6, 19 says that a false witness who breathes out lies is an abomination to the Lord. But this commandment is, is more broad in its implications than just a court trial setting. It covers lying in general, whether that's by giving a false testimony or by withholding part of a true testimony, since both of these ultimately, again, distort other people's account or their perception of the truth. Consider Acts 5, where Ananias and Sapphira sell their property and they give the proceeds to the church, but they secretly held back a portion of that for themselves. So they were being generous to the church, but they are trying to be deceptive and make themselves look more generous than they were so that they would gain the same favor likely as Barnabas in the earlier chapter, in Acts chapter 4. So they are deceiving. And so Peter confronts Ananias saying, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And Ananias falls down on the spot and breathes his last. And Sapphira shortly after that meets the similar end. And that probably strikes most of us as a very swift and a very severe judgment upon them. But it is a reminder that God does not pervert justice and the wages of our sin is death. But in contrast, then, we as Christians are called to be a people who care about the truth and called to then be truthful in what we do, to love the truth. Consider Psalm 15, verses 1 through 3. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks the truth in his heart. 
who does not slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his friend. And Paul in Philippians 4, 8 writes, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So we're called to be a people who love and embrace the truth and are concerned with the truth, especially when we look at the news. It can be very easy to get caught up with emotions in the news, but when we read the news, we shouldn't care about how things fall out for our side of the political spectrum or anything like that. We should be concerned about the truth. The 10th commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So most of the previous commandments we looked at have dealt with our outward actions, how we treat other people, interact with other people. But this commandment causes us to examine our hearts. The Hebrew word here for covet in this commandment doesn't just mean covet. More generally, it means desire. For example, David uses the same word in Psalm 19.10. Speaking of God's law and commandments, David says, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. So we can desire good things, but inevitably that means we can desire wrong things. And so coveting is when our desires are directed towards wrong things. Uh, there is a word picture that oh, I'm going to make this. I'm going to say this name wrong, but Thabiti Anyabule um, <laughs> had a little commentary about this, and he had a really good word picture um, that I wanted to borrow. He says, "If you can imagine the heart having hands, coveting is like the heart grasping for things, desiring things, laying hold of things that don't properly belong to it. When we covet." What we're actually saying is that God has not apportioned his creation properly because he hasn't given us everything we desire. And so the heart in its fallen sinful way grasps for things that don't belong to it. So that's the, the negative side of things. That's what we're to avoid is our hearts reaching out and trying to lay hold of things that don't belong to us. But then what should we do? What's the positive implication of this? Contentment, being happy with the things that God has placed in our possession. As Paul declares in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, he said, I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And likewise, Paul again writes in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 and following, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these things we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So again, that's an encouragement to us to be content, and as we find ourselves coveting, to then take those desires captive, to turn them toward Christ and confession and trusting him to slowly but surely sanctify us. So at this point, I'll invite you to join with me in confessing the words of the New City Catechism. It should appear on your screen shortly. I'll read the question and invite you to join with me in reading the answer. So what does God require in the ninth and 10th commandments? Ninth, that we do not lie or deceive, but speak the truth in love. 10th, that we are content not envying anyone or resenting what God has given them or us. I'll just take a moment again to pray. So Lord, as we again consider your commandments, these things have been written thousands of years ago. They are not irrelevant to us today. For as many things have changed, as much as technology may have changed, mankind has not changed. The heart of mankind has not changed. We have not been perfected along the way, but rather, Lord, we are still corrupt from the root. We are still sinners who seek out sin. Yet, Lord, I thank you that even as we consider these things, as they show how we fall short, that we can look to Jesus, your son, he who knew no sin, who became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So today, again, I pray that you would turn us by faith, to rest ourselves and, and our hope, not in the works that we can do, which will always fall short, but rather, Lord, to turn to Christ, to place our faith in him and what he has done, what he has purchased for us, and how he has indeed purchased us by his work on the cross. Thank you for the love that you've shown us through him. 
And now as we turn your attention further to your word, to the preaching of your word, I pray that you uphold Joe, that you bless him and uphold him in this task. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.